Thank you for coming to Getting Started with Linux Game Development. And please welcome Ryan Gordon from Iculus. Hi, my name's Ryan. Um, I'm going to talk to you for about an hour about Linux game development. Um, I cannot actually see any of you through the lights, but if you could raise your hands if you are doing Linux development now. I'm trying to get a feel for the audience here. OK, some of you, that's cool. Some of you want to get into it. Some of you are just here to see if I like wet my pants on stage. OK, that guy over there. Okay. Good, good, good. OK, so we'll get right into this. So. Uh, just a few notes before we start. Um, feel free to interrupt me. If you have a question, raise your hand. I will try to see you. Just wave violently if you don't get my attention. I don't mind if, if the whole talk changes because you ask a really interesting question. That's great for all of us. Um, the slides are not there yet, but later today I'm going to be posting these slides on that website. You can come back and check. That URL will be up there later if you want to go back and check it again. Um, today's just a high-level overview. There's, you could talk for thousands of hours about the nitty gritty of things and you know, like disassembling code and stuff like that. We're not doing that today. We'll do a little tiny bit of code up on these slides, but for the most part, I'm just telling you things you should go and look at yourself and do more research on, uh, just so you know what direction you should be going. Um, a little bit about me to get started. I'm a hacker in the positive sense of that term. I do a lot of tinkering with interesting code. Uh, I'm a game developer. I work on games, but I also port games. That's what most people know me for. If you have a game that uh, needs to run on something it's never run on before, if it's uh, Linux or Mac OS or you know, you're the toaster in your kitchen or something like that, that people hire me to do that. I parachute in and work magic and leave again. Um, I port games. I build tools when I'm not porting games to make porting games easier and make game development easier. And I'm not going to pimp those too much today, so, but uh, maybe a little bit. Uh, I'm a freelance. I've been doing this for 15 years, uh, port literally porting games to Linux for 15 years. So this is not a new thing because of SteamOS. There's been a market for this for a long time. Um, uh, just give you an idea of some of the people that have ported games to Linux that I've worked with and ported things uh, that I've worked with. This is my NASCAR jacket. Um, these aren't in here in any order. Uh, you know, don't. You know, feel like you have to judge the epic one's bigger or anything like that. Um, so I've, I've worked for lots of companies in lots of time zones and stuff like that. This is my most demanding client right now. Uh, she takes up most of my time. That's my daughter. Okay, so enough about me. Um, okay, let's talk about Linux. You're here today because you care about Linux. You, you're interested in SteamOS or you're interested in Linux desktop or something to that regard. Um, why would you want to? Uh, as you know, Reddit has asked many times before. I'm going to say, first off, it's a very new and unsaturated market. Um, if you want to ship a game on Windows, you're competing with every other game on the planet. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, the, the, as in all, almost all systems, the best things tend to rise to the top. But being a new market, it's hungry for content at all. So you don't have to compete with you know, the next AAA game. Like, you don't have to worry about you know, worrying when Battlefield 5 is going to ship or something like that. You can go into a market, and there's eager people willing to buy it because they have much less crap to wade through. Um, there's a much lower barrier to entry. If anyone, has anyone in here done console development? PlayStation 4, PlayStation 3, Xbox? A lot of you, wow. Um, as you know, it's really, really hard. You can't just walk in off the street and do PlayStation 3 development. Not only is it technically very, very challenging, as I'm sure some of you will agree, uh, you can't just, you need to sign contracts and non-disclosure agreements. You need to pay Sony or Microsoft or Nintendo a lot of money. Uh, and go through certification processes. This is the barrier to entry for Linux. You download a CD image off the internet and you put it in your machine. Now you're a Linux developer. So uh, that, 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 that's, uh, that's good. You can just start immediately. There's no cost. All you need is a machine and some basic knowledge of how to program. Uh, there's no walled garden. And this is a problem that we're running into on other systems, um, the Mac App Store, the iOS App Store. Uh, of course, you know, the, the consoles themselves, that nobody dictates what you can write, no one dictates what your content looks like, nobody cares what the, about certifying your product. Uh, you are entirely in control of what you build, how you build it, when you patch it, what your product should be is entirely in your hands, and nobody can dictate whether you're allowed to sell it, which is the most important thing about that. Um, and of course, uh, the Steam OS and the Steam machines, which might be why you're here, as you're interested in that as a console unit. Uh, that's obviously a very important reason to be on Linux. Um, I want to talk about myth busting a little bit. Um, some of you are probably very familiar with some of these myths. Some of the, you might have heard of some of these myths. Um, OK. First off, there's something that people keep talking about, which, which is distro fragmentation. 
you know, oh no, if there, there's thousands of different variations of Linux and you know, you have to build for all of them and you have to, uh, you know, make little tweaks for every single user out there. And it's just not true. I've been doing this for 15 years and every game I've shipped, which I'm, my last count was around 60 or so games, most of, many of them AAA titles, we ship one binary that works on every Linux system out there that has reasonable hardware and, you know, an operating, that was in, an operating system that was installed in the last, you know, five years or so, 10 years or so. Um, it, it, disparate fragmentation is not a problem. Everyone talks about the thousands of variations on Linux, and there are variations, there certainly are, and you can customize Linux very nicely to whatever you want to do, whether it's you, you want to be your new desktop operating system or you want to be your new you know, Valve console. You can totally do those things, but you can still target one binary that works for everyone. Um, most hardware is supported. In fact, you, you hear this a lot, oh, you're gonna get that weird random device you bought on, at like a flea market or something and plug in your machine and it'll have Windows drivers and never work on Linux. And uh, that has been a problem if this was still like say 1997 or something like that. Um, in modern times, most things that you wanna use on Linux work out of the box. In fact, older hardware is even much more supported on Linux because there's lots and lots of hardware drivers out there for Windows 98 that never got updated for Windows XP and later. So you'd be surprised that you might find that there's actually more hardware when you take the entire pool of existing hardware on the planet. There might be more hardware that works for Linux at this point than Windows. Um, GPU drivers are good. Uh, if you're using the NVIDIA drivers, they're incredibly good. It's literally the same code base that you get on Windows. Uh, AMD, AMD ships their own drivers. There's open source ones, and even those are not bad. They can do shaders and you know uh, high level, uh, high end features. Uh, it's not limited to like, you know, Super Mario Brothers level graphics or anything like that. So um, th those are, uh, you, you shouldn't have any problems with that. Uh, Linux users spend money on software. Now this is very, very important because this is the thing you always hear. Oh, these people with this free operating system, they're a bunch of hippies, they don't pay for software, that's why they're running Linux and stuff like that. Uh, and that's true, most of these people do not want to pay hundreds of dollars to Microsoft for a Windows license or, you know, thousands of dollars to Apple for a MacBook, but um, but they do spend money on software, and we've seen evidence of that. You can see uh, success stories coming out of the, the Linux launch of Steam. Uh, you can see uh, Humble Bundle does uh, uh, games. They ship. They try to ship all their games for Linux as well, and they show you a breakdown on the main page by platform. How much are people paying on Windows? How much are people paying on Mac? You know, the rich people on Mac, and how much are people paying on Linux? And historically universally, uh, across every sale they've ever done, even games that do not have a Linux port for sale, the Linux people have always paid more on average than the Windows people and the Mac people, believe it or not. Now, to be fair, it's a smaller market. There's less warm bodies for now, but right now they are paying more per game than people on any other platform. Um, so. Uh, you know, the, the, there's money to be had there. People are leaving money on the table by not having a Linux port of their software. Um, can you all hear me? I'm holding this mic a little far from my face. Yeah, okay, good. Um, okay, tech you need is available for Linux. Um, we're gonna talk about that on the next slide. A lot of times the, the thought was, well, we can build our game, but we have all these pieces that, are part, that other people built that we plugged into our game and it's not available and that's not true. Lots and lots of tech that you come to rely on exists in a native Linux version that you can use. All right, so here's the good news. Middleware is largely available. You have physics engines, audio libraries, you know, uh, um, and modeling stuff. Chances are it probably exists on Linux or they will give you source code if you want to do your own port and usually it's fairly trivial. Um, both approaches have happened but um, if you want to, uh, you know, lots and lots of companies have been offering this uh, for a long time now and it's not like we just, you know, plopped out a Linux port yesterday. A lot of these have been, uh, ready to go and stable and debugged on Linux for a decade or more now. And uh, I, I can't even begin to list them all. Chances are if you go down the list of middleware in your game, chances are most of them work. So I won't even uh, try to list them all right now. But chances are they already are there. You should ask and they'll have it ready for you. Uh, engines that you use for your games probably already work on Linux or can be made to work on Linux fairly easily. Uh, are any, is anyone here from Unity 3D? That guy, talk to that guy because if you want a Linux port, you click a button and you get a, you get a Linux port of your Unity game. It's pretty cool. Uh, Unreal has been known to work. We shipped Dungeon Defenders on it. Uh, Papo EO just shipped 
last week as a Linux version using Unreal Engine 3. Um, id Tech has been known to work. Uh, 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 Leadworks is coming, is coming this year to Linux. Josh, are you here somewhere? Yeah, talk to Josh if you want uh, lead work stuff. Uh, I'm just gathering everyone in this room. You can all talk to each other. Um, <clears throat> tools that you use that you come to rely on. A lot of you probably use Perforce. I'm sorry if you do, but it totally exists on Linux. It's been available for decades now, so you can just use the command line version or you can use P4V. They both exist and work just fine on Linux. Um, uh, lots of other tools, which I can't think of right now, uh, that you probably come to rely on. A lot of them might be open source. If you're using perhaps Serversion for your version control, uh, that exists on Linux. Obviously, it probably existed there before anywhere else. Um, <clears throat> cool new tech that you use exists on Linux. A lot of people here talking about the Oculus Rift. Is anyone here from Oculus? I heard someone clap. You're out there somewhere. I don't know. But uh, the Oculus Rift, their SDK works on Linux right out of the box right now. Uh, is, is Zach here from Leap Motion? He's back there. If you want to use Leap Motion in your project, the SDK for that's available for Linux. You can plug it right in and do your thing. You know, the, the things that are, you know, disruptive technology and trend setting things for the future, they are coming to Linux at the same time now because there's this buzz and this excitement. And you can take advantage of it and build cool products that work there. <clears throat> okay, here's the bad news. If you need Visual Studio, this is going to get really hard for you. Um, and I sympathize with that because, you know, Look at the first thing on this slide. <laughs> Everyone loves the text editor they started with, right? So um, the good news is a lot of people start with Emacs and VI. That's out there if you want it. I don't like either of them. I'm sure everyone can have their holy war about this. Um, there's lots of other good ones that are incredibly powerful tools, too, like Sublime Text works on Mac. Windows and Linux, and it looks the same on every platform, works the same on every platform. Qt Creator looks a lot like Visual Studio. Someone's going to throw fruit at me for saying that, but, um, it, but it's also cross-platform. You can just use the same tool on every platform and get like a nice visual debugger if you want and stuff like that. Uh, Code Blocks is an option. Eclipse, if you have thousands of gigabytes of RAM to spend. Um, th these things all work on Linux, and if you're used to using them on Windows, then you can just jump right over with no thing. Question. Oh, uh, uh, Sam says that Visual GDB is also awesome. I'll, I'll add that to the, the slides when I upload them. Um, there are other options I had to stop because I ran out of space, but um, I understand it's really hard if you need Visual Studio because that's what you're used to, and there can be a learning curve. Some of these are incredibly powerful, and I would say more powerful than Visual Studio, but you might take a little time to get used to it, especially if you need an entire environment or you need the text error to have just the exact right feel. And, but th there are options, there are powerful options, and there are cross-platform options that are available for every platform. All right, the porting process. This is really what you're here for. We're talking about how to develop games for Linux. Um, this is fairly simple. It sounds really hard, but it's simple. The zen of this is that porting a game is just overcoming obstacles until you run out of obstacles to overcome. Um, that's actually true for game development in general, I suppose. But, um, but it's fairly simple. There's a very simple process to this. Um, here's what you should do. If you're a Windows developer, if you're not a Windows developer, tune out for this slide. But if you're a Windows developer, move to S SDL first. SDL is Simple Direct Media Layer. We'll talk about this uh, a little bit more, and there's a whole other talk about this tomorrow uh, with a really stunningly attractive guy giving it. Um, so move to SDL first. That will rip out a good portion of your Windows code and give you the exact same functionality on Windows, but now that code will work on lots and lots of platforms. Um, mostly in this case, what I'm talking about, it'll deal with taking care of joystick input for you and game controllers. It'll talk about you know spinning threads. It'll talk about getting a window on the screen, getting mouse input. You know, A lot of the low-level plumbing stuff you think of for game development uh, that you build engines on top of, SDL provides that. So rip out the Windows-specific code that you've always hated and nobody knows how to maintain anymore and replace it with a couple of function calls to SDL. Once you get that far, rip out your Direct3D renderer. Don't get nervous. You can keep it in there. But you know, make sure you can also do, direct, uh, you can also do OpenGL. <clears throat> Once you get these two things done, you have your game running where SDL is making the window, and Open, et cetera, and OpenGL is doing the rendering, you are 90% of the way there. Those are the two hardest things about porting any piece of software to Linux, uh, any, any game software to Linux. Um, at that point, install Linux, and then you can, come, uh, you can climb over the other obstacles. But those are the two hardest things, and you don't even have to leave your normal workstation to do them. Um, very, very important. It will save you sanity. It will save you an enormous amount of time, uh, and it'll make you employable at lots of companies after you're done, because you're going to know a lot of interesting stuff. Okay, 
So now that you have it on Linux, uh, and like I said, we'll talk about SDL and stuff more later, and there's another talk about it. Once, you, once you're at the point where you're trying to actually build it on Linux, you've had this thing, you've ported on Windows, it's running, it uses SDL and it uses OpenGL, so those parts are solved. You don't have to touch them anymore for Linux, more or less. Um, the first thing you have to do is get this thing compiling. So you have three options for compilers, more or less. There's GCC. Who's used GCC in here? All right. A lot of Sony developers, I guess. That's cool. Uh, who's used Clang in here? A lot of iOS developers. Okay. Um, and then there's Intel C++. Has anyone used this? I can't believe it. Hands went up. I was going to take that off the slides. Okay. Um, it exists. I've never, ever seen a game that uses it, but I'm sure there are some out there. I just put it up there as an option. You can install it and use it if you want to. You should probably be focusing on GCC or Clang, uh, whatever your preference may be. In fact, your preference might be to be both, because Clang tends to compile faster, and GCC tends to present, produce better code. So some people actually switch between the two uh, for release and debug builds uh, if they're really hardcore. Uh, now, the thing is, once you know what compiler you're going to use or you, you have a compiler you're going to play around with, you need to figure out how to build the thing. And there's some options for this. There's lots and lots of options. There's almost as many build tools as there are text editors. Uh, I picked a couple that I like and a couple that I hate. Um, Make files are the obvious one. That's everyone that's ever used any piece of Unix software has probably seen one of these at some point or another. <clears throat> they, uh, they're simple, they're straightforward, nobody likes them. And I understand why, it's 1970s technology. So they work if you need to just knock something out really quickly. A better solution is one of the next two on here, either CMake or PreMake. And they're very, very different things, but I'll, go th I'll explain them very, very briefly for you here. CMake is a project generator. Like, you don't actually use it as a project file. You use it as a scripting language that describes your project file. And then as you say, these are the source codes I want to build. These are the libraries I want to link against. These are the compiler options I care about. And then at the other side, it spits out a make file, or it spits out a Visual Studio project, or an Xcode project. Um, it's actually really nice. I would actually recommend using something like this on Windows, too, if you can you know, totally eject yourself from Visual Studio. And then you have one text file that controls your entire project on every platform. And that's pretty cool. Instead of having to be like, oh, Windows developer added you know, a new source file, and now the build's broken everywhere else. Well, you don't have to update the other project files. There's just one project file, and the rest is just metadata that the, compil that the compiler spit out. Premake is similar to that. The, the real benefit of Premake is it's small, it has no dependencies, and the scripting language it uses is Lua. Who likes Lua? There's always less hands for Lua than I think there's gonna be. Okay, um, you, you literally write your project file descriptions in Lua, and you can do clever things because it's a full Turing complete programming language, and eventually it spits out Visual Studio or whatnot like that. The last one I listed up here was Scons. It's written in Python. You write your scripts in Python in the same way, but instead of it spitting out projects, it is actually the project itself. It will call the compiler and make sure your dependencies are up to date and stuff like that. It doesn't spit out Visual Studio projects or anything like that. Um, I don't like it. A lot of people swear by it. I think it depends on whether you like Python or not. Um, now, the problem is this, is that what do you do to get you, you, you probably have a Visual Studio project file and you need to build something, one of these things. So you can, depending on what kind of Visual Studio you have, this is what it looks like. These are uh, Visual Studio of all the awful things they've done. They did manage to make their config files XML. So you can parse through here and find all your source code if you want to write a very simple XML thing. I actually, because they were nice enough to make them always look like this in Visual Studio 2008 and lower, and like this in Visual Studio 2010 and later, you can write a little Perl script and just spit it out once and then, you know, whatever. Uh, some, I've seen people that do this and they, they parse out the source code from that and just have it automatically build the Linux stuff and they only maintain the Visual Studio project. You do what you want to do. There's lots and lots of options. Nobody I, I'm aware of has shipped a nice convenient tool to make this automatic because most of us do it once and then never again. Um, and that's what one-liners of Perl are designed to be for, right? Um, okay, so. Eventually you have a make file, you have a compiler, and the compiler starts building stuff, and in inevitably there are a million warnings and a million errors, and you get one source file into this and you're stopped dead. So there's a general policy for this. This is the, this is the mantra, say it over and over again. When in doubt, stub it out. This is your new macro, this is your best friend. Um, all this does is say, you know, whenever you need to come back to something later, you type stubbed and a little message about what is stubbed. Come back and, you know, implement the renderer. You know, come back and 
figure out how to figure out the total RAM in the system or something like that. Um, you can get really fancy with this. You're not, this won't be on the test. You don't have to copy this down. Um, but you can do really fancy stuff. Like, please don't spam this stub message over and over again. Like, the main loop where you keep checking for new mouse input, you know, you don't want to see thousands of these per second. So um, you can be fancier. We're not going to get into all of that. But so you'll probably have code like this somewhere. You know, that, that's the standard Win32 message box call. Uh, oh no, we're out of memory. So you want to just very simply start doing things like this. If it's Windows, do the message box. If not, put this stub message so I know I have to come back to it later. Now this is ugly code. This is not your permanent solution, obviously. But this is enough to get, all you want to do right now is get this thing running. Um, so you want to have, you want to build this thing, stub out anything that doesn't, so you're finally, when you get the thing to build, you run it the first time and you see stub, 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 crash. Okay, good. It's like duck, duck, goose, but, you know, with programming. Um, that's good, though, because you know you're, you're halfway there. You know you're not going to run into, like, this library is totally missing, you know. So when in doubt, stub it out and keep on moving. Don't get fancy with it. Don't try to fix things right now. Just stub things out. Don't ever do this. Uh, if Linux, some non-Windows thing, because inevitably you'll come to some other platform. Suddenly you're going to need an iOS port, a Mac port, a PlayStation 4 port, an Xbox One port. Do this instead. This is what you actually meant. Um, but that happens all the time, especially when someone goes into this mentality as, I am porting this to Linux. No, you're not. You're taking it away from Windows. So just be clear and say what you mean. It'll make your life easier later. But definitely, definitely do not do this where you go, if it's Windows, do the Windows thing. If it's PlayStation, do the PlayStation thing. I don't know what the actual defines are for PlayStation, so sorry if that's not it. Um, because what will happen now is the Linux compile, when you compile this on Linux, it'll be like, cool, bro, nothing to compile. No warnings, no indication that there was something you were supposed to call here that you're not. It'll just quietly go along its way and your program will not do the right thing. So do this instead. You know, you, you want to try and gate people off here where it's like, if you bring this to a new platform, you will fail until you deal with this, period. And even better would be to actually take out some Windows thing and some PlayStation thing and actually just have some thing and then localize those if desks that. You, it's really, really easy to get that macro salsa, you know what I'm talking about, where it's like 15 ifs, if Steam, if debug, if Windows, if blah, 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 you know, and there's one line of code down there and you have no idea which else this went to, so. Um, just try to keep it simple and try to keep code quality. You want to minimize your changes, but you also want to try and not make the system more awful. And you want to make it more robust. So when this eventually comes to the next platform, you know you have to fix something there. Um, which brings us to this thing really quickly. I wasn't going to talk about this, but I decided to. Uh, who in here has ever written some assembly language for a game? All right, real game developers in here. I like it. Um, that, that is uh, code that does nothing at all, of any meaning at least. Uh, we set the ECX register to one, then we move it into EAX. Why you would do that? You wouldn't, but that's just, you know, for example, code here. That's what that looks like on Visual Studio. That's how you would compile to get the compiler to do that. This is what it looks like in GCC. Don't ever do this. Um, uh, the, the, you could talk for an hour about the magical syntax of this. You can do some incredible, interesting, and powerful things with this. But my actual advice for you is don't ever use inline assembly. You, a lot of you probably aren't at this point because it's 2014. But um, there is occasionally you get little pockets of this. And these will absolutely not compile on Linux until you change it over. And now you have the worst thing in the world. You have the exact same assembly code twice. Maybe until you change one of them. So uh, seriously, don't do it. Don't ever do it. Most people need assembly nowadays because they need compiler intrinsics. They want to get like the timestamp counter, or you know, they want to get access to atomic operations that are you know like literal opcodes for the x86 or something like that. There, there are compiler intrinsics in GCC. You can do this without having to write inline assembly. So that's the major use for inline assembly. If you're trying to make stuff go faster. Rewrite it in C, man. The compiler's going to beat you. It's time to give up on the inline assembly, um, unless you're doing something really, really low level, like you know, self-modifying code or something. But really, you should not be doing that at this point. It doesn't prove you to be cooler or anything anymore. Um, so there's compiler intrinsics. SDL offers functionality for all the other things you would want. Like if you want atomic operations, there's an API for that. And it handles all that and figures out how it works on your platform. If you want performance counters like you would get on Windows with you know, query performance counter, this is, they have operations for that. Don't ever do it. If, and also, for those that are in this boat on Windows, if you're using Win64, no inline assembly. Can't do it with Microsoft's compiler if you're, using, if you're targeting 64-bit Windows. Um, 
which you should be if you're not. It's just about time for that. Um, if you're doing that, you have to do the same. If, if you want inline assembly, you have to do the same thing as Windows 64. Use an external assembler, which should be enough to demotivate you from ever doing it. But there's something called NASM. It's an open source project. It understands Intel syntax assembly and stuff like that. Uh, the other thing you might have noticed on this is that if you can see how this pops. You notice how the assembly opcodes are in different orders? ECX1, and on the next slide it's one ECX. It's all backwards, you don't wanna do that. So use an external tool and use your existing assembly, but really just get rid of the assembly language. You don't need it, you don't want it. Um, okay, uh, Okay. so we're getting to compiling. We've taken care of the, pro we've, co we've commented out the problem code, we've gotten rid of our inline assembly just for the greater good of mankind. Uh, at this point, fix the simple things. Like if there's, uh, like the message box thing, you can just stick a, there's a call in SDL that'll pop up a message box for you and not have, it's, it's one function call. You don't have to do anything fancy to use that example from before. If it's simple, if you can change it in a line or two of code or you can clean it up in a line or two of code, just do it now. But do not touch anything else. And there's two reasons for this. One, when you're refactoring something for another platform, it's easy to just start refactoring things where you go, oh, I don't like the, why did they do that? You're now looking at literally every piece of this code. So you're gonna start to see things that everyone has been ignoring for years. And you're gonna start to be like, that's some really awful code. Everyone has this in their code base. You know, you're all acting like you have this poker face right now. But seriously, everyone's got it, and it's usually the other guy. I know it's not you, but um, there's this real motivation to go in there and be like, oh, you know, it would take 10 minutes to just rework this so it was cleaner. It doesn't use a global variable over here. Don't do that because one, that's a sinkhole you will never claw your way out of. But also. It makes it harder to merge this stuff back in. When you merge the Linux port back into the main code base that everyone's using, oh, if I didn't say it, it's important that eventually you have a Linux code base that builds on Windows also, or builds on any platform. You don't wanna have the Linux fork over here and the Windows fork over here, because you're gonna end up making bug fixes to one and improvements to the other, and then you're gonna spend the rest of your life merging code, and nobody needs that, and there's not enough interns to do that for you. So eventually you wanna have one code base that builds everywhere. So for now, fix simple things, don't touch anything you don't have to, so you can merge it back in. And then you can go make notes to clean things up later if you, know, you are bored. But, um, but the, it's, a, it's amazing the psychological uh, fascination with cleaning things up when you get the chance to. So try to fight that urge. I'm telling you to write worse code. I'm sorry, it's probably the best advice right now. Okay, got it compiling? Let's get it linking. We're talking about middleware. I said lots of things work before. Maybe you're using fmod for your audio stuff. They have a Linux version, just plop it in there, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, Havoc has their stuff. Uh, Rad Game Tools, all their libraries pretty much work on Linux, et cetera. There's a thousand middleware companies. There's, there's probably as many middleware companies as there are people in this room times 20. So most of the time you can get it. If you can't, you might have to fight with people or talk about licensing or trying to get the source code from them to build your own Linux version, et cetera. But, Go from there. System dependencies. In a perfect world, all your game talks to is the C runtime library or, and the C++ runtime library. Um, you don't want to ever talk to any other system dependencies than that if you can help it. Now, it's usually not hard because most of those things are handled by SDL. Um, it will try to figure out what the system has available and do the right thing, so you don't have to try and figure that out for it. Um, but you, you want to be careful about what you're shipping and trying to control what you ship. Like, you know, Zlib is basically a system dependency on Linux in that it, it exists on any Linux system you can imagine, but you probably want to try to be shipping your own, or better yet, use Mini-Z so you don't have to ever look at Zlib again. Um, you want to try to minimize the number of times you're calling out the things that you think will be on the end user system, um, which is kind of a black art, and you have to just see what's in your code base, and you know, uh, try not to find wor workarounds that are like, oh, this system will probably have this installed, because then you will start cutting down on your user base that can run your program, or you'll start cutting down your user base that can launch your program. So uh, try to avoid that and try to, to be very clear about what dependencies are. There's, there's a nice little tool that will show you everything that you're directly linked to so you can figure out what needs to be cleaned up. It's called a read elf and I'll put that in the slides later. I should have. Okay, get it running, get her done. Uh, use SDL2, I mentioned this before. It covers lots and lots of things from video to input to audio output to game controllers to timers and threads and stuff like that. It basically, you wanna think of that as like the wrapper over any platform level code. And I think you'll find that in most game development cases, 
SDL will cover everything you are calling the Win32 API for. Um, if you use that, most of your problems will be solved and most of your program will just work on Linux by default and work lots of other places too. Um, we, we have a game that we moved over to SDL2 and then with zero lines of code, it was working on iOS. I mean, it didn't have a touchscreen interface yet or anything, but and then with zero lines of code, it was running on a Raspberry Pi. You know, it's, you'd be surprised what happens when you eliminate the platform specific dependencies and SDL covers that for you. And I mentioned before, use OpenGL. That's how you get 3D acceleration on this platform. Um, it's not a bad API. It's very different to use than direct 3D, but more or less the functionality, they're in parity with each other. So if you need something on one, you can probably find it on the other. Um, uh, and like I said, if you have OpenGL there, then all your renderer will probably work and your renderer is where you're gonna spend most of your development time. Uh, maybe use OpenAL. Maybe. Uh, OpenAL is an audio library. It's a 3D audio library. It's very simple to use. It's got, it, it's not the most functional thing on the planet. If you're doing crazy like DSP transformations and stuff, you might want to look somewhere else. You might want to do, you know, FMOD or uh, Miles Sound System or something like that. There's other options. OpenAL is a nice simple one if you're just ripping out Direct Sound or Direct Sound 3D or X Audio or something like that. Um, if you're literally just doing the lower level PCM, you just you mix your own audio and you want to spit it out to the audio hardware and you don't care how it gets there, SDL will handle that for you. But if you need a higher level library, OpenAL is a good option. Um, and finally, use the Steam runtime. I talked about system dependencies before. If you ship your Linux version on Steam, they offer an entire Linux system bundled up with Steam. So you can guarantee that certain libraries will be there, certain dependencies will be available to you. Um, it depends on you shipping on Steam though. So uh, I, I found a lot of people that are not necessarily shipping on Steam will still use the compiler that ships with the Steam runtime because it tends to be a good, sane, stable compiler. Um, and, but you know, that's for another talk. Okay, let's talk about file system gotchas real quick here. Um, anyone that's ever used a Unix system understands that the file system works nothing like Windows. Maybe not, okay. Uh, if you're used to Windows, I couldn't help it, I'm a C programmer, I had to escape the Windows path up there. Um, you use the, the, the slash instead of the backslash that Windows uses for path separation. Uh, paths have a single root, there's no drive letters on Linux, you just have the root of the file system and then you have subdirectories off of that, so. Um, uh, even if you have multiple hard drives, they will all become part of that one virtual tree of files, um, uh, which can be a gotcha for some people. Like if you're expecting to save to C colon, you know, my documents or something, then you have to be careful for that. Um, user permissions are much tighter, and this has gotten to be much more true on Windows in recent years, but if you're still on, say, like Windows XP, if you're still targeting that, it's easy to write to, say, the directory your game is installed to and save the config file there. That doesn't fly so much on Linux and, or Mac or lots of other places like iOS, so you're gonna have to clean this up eventually anyway. You're gonna have to clean this up eventually for Windows if you haven't already, but it's, it's gotten to the point where, uh, the, the way the file system works, there's a lot less of it the average user has access to write to. So you wanna make sure that you write to their own home directory and that if there's a second user on the system, they get their own set of configurations and stuff like that. Um, this isn't completely foreign to Windows, but a lot of Windows developers have not paid attention to this because they didn't have to until relatively recently, if then even. Um, the file system is always Unicode, but only sort of. Um, Oh, we'll get to that on the next slide. I'll talk about that. But a, a lot of people, there, there is no distinction on the system between a Unicode API and a ANSI API, as Windows calls it. It's always Unicode, but it's a little bit complicated, and I'll explain that in a moment. And also, and most importantly, I saved the best for last, holy crap, it's case sensitive. If you have two files that only change by the case of their letters, like you have hello in lowercase and hello in capital letters, they're two separate files. They will not right over the first file with that second one. So you have to be careful of that. And more importantly, if you try to open something with the wrong case, it won't find it. It'll say it's not there. Uh, this is a problem. I think this is a bad design. This is the way Unix has always worked and it's not gonna go away because the people that decide these things have decided that's how it's always gonna be. So you have to prepare for that. You have to prepare for that in your own uh, source code too. For example, you know, pound include my header file. If the case is wrong, it's not gonna find it. So. Uh, You'll be running into this things. Lots and lots of games I've shipped have a little routine that, you know, pound define f open, and then we call a special function that will find the correct case of the file and go from there. Um, it's better if you can clean it out properly. It's even better if your game ships with a couple of little pack files, so you only ever have to find three or four things on the physical file system, not like a whole directory tree. Um, 
the way you approach that depends on what's right for your game. But just be aware that the file system is case sensitive, which will mean that things will fail in interesting ways until you clean it up. Uh, Unicode. <clears throat> Linux has a Unicode system. Um, all file system calls and all file names in the file system are encoded in UTF-8, which if you've never used this before, it's very interesting because you, you don't have uh, WCharT or capital WCharT like you would have on Windows. You don't have a multi-byte thing. You have constchar, one byte per character, sort of. If you're using American English, you know, A through Z, zero through nine, a couple other punctuation things, it's always eight bits per character. When you get into European things, things with accents, and especially when you get into Asian languages where there's all sorts of different glyphs that make up the language, suddenly those characters become bigger. So the reason it's gone this way is compatibility. All the system calls have always had always in ancient times, back you know, before the internet, everything was const char, and one byte was good enough for everyone that was doing language um, before the, we realized there was you know, other countries. Um, sorry about that, but uh, so UTF-8 is a good uh, solution for that. It lets all the existing code continue to sort of work unless you know you throw something really weird at. More importantly, string compare will still work with UTF-8 just like it does now because it will sort the way you would expect it to, even with multi-byte characters. Um, there's never a null character in the middle of your string with UTF-8. Um, so. If you have wide literally wide characters like you know two bytes per character or whatnot like that, you should convert to UTF-8 before you write to the file system with a file name or you call a system call uh, because that's what the system will expect. Um, and it's nice because, like I said, if you haven't cared about Unicode, you're about halfway there to being okay. You still have some things to fix, but it's not a total disaster if you're using UTF-8. Now, if you're using WCharT on Windows, it's two bytes per character, the basic multilingual plane. Uh, covers most of the planet, doesn't cover Klingon. Um, on Linux, you have WHRT, it works the way you'd expect it to, except it's four bytes per character, 32 bits. Um, and it covers everything that humanity has ever imagined for a character that we could write down on the wall of a cave. Everything is in there, including Klingon, I'm not joking about that. Um, I don't know why it's there, but it is. Um, so um, that's there. This is not a problem for most code bases because most things that deal with wide characters on Windows just care about an array of characters. And that array just doesn't happen to be charred. It happens to be 16 bits and you iterate through it or you step backwards on it or whatnot like that. Um, the only time this really gets to be a problem is that you, I mean, it, obviously you're using more memory per character, but on desktop Linux, that's, you're probably not using that much string data that you're just gonna crush the machine. The problem is that serialization happens. You write Unicode strings to disk for your, you know, your game or something like that. You have to be careful that you're gonna read two bytes and convert it to four bytes. And it's a simple cast. You just go from you know, a 16-bit int to a 32-bit int, same values in them. You just have to understand that what you're reading from disk and the size of that character is different. And if you don't, you'll have really weird things when you try to load your game data if you're using 16-bit Unicode from Windows. Um, there's a library that comes on the system called iConvert. It's part of the standard C runtime on Linux. It's really complicated and fancy, and it can convert between just about any encoding. For some, if you're just going from 16-bit to UTF-8 or something, you can roll your own in 20 lines of C code, so you probably don't need to get really heavy weight on that, but it's there if you want it, or you can roll your own. Um, the other thing about UTF-8, it would be nice to use it everywhere, but you can't step backwards over it, and it, you have to encode it character by character. You have to parse it character by character to see if there's larger characters in there. So um, ideally what you want to do is use it as a transfer format. You're putting it to disk. You're putting it to, you're sending a string over the network or whatever. You're calling a system call, and then you want to try and get it into w WHRT if you care about Unicode stuff. If you don't care about Unicode stuff, you should start caring about Unicode stuff because that's where your audience is going to be eventually. Um, Okay, so we have the game compiling, we got it linking, and it crashed on startup. Not unusual, happens to the best of us. Um, okay, so you wanna get that thing to bug, and there's lots and lots of options for this too, and they're varying quality. The first one I listed here is GDB, it's the GNU debugger. Um, if you've ever used Linux in the last thousand years, you've probably seen this thing, uh, if you're a C programmer, or a C++ programmer. Uh, it's hard to use, it's a command line interface. It's kind of like VI, you know, it's like you get, you, you get muscle memory for it if you use it long enough, but it's really, really intimidating if you're coming in there as a new user. Um, but it also has a really nice feature, which I'm also gonna talk about with UndoDB. Uh, GDB7, which is the latest version of this, features something called reverse debugging. Has anyone heard of this? That one guy, you're awesome, don't ever stop being cool. Um, 
reverse debugging is like TiVo for debugging. Now, the way you usually debug things is you, you get a crash report and then you try and reproduce it. If you can reproduce it, you set a breakpoint as close to that bug as you think you can get and then you inch towards it. And you try and step and step and step and oh shit, it crashed. And then you start again. You try and inch a little slower next time until you can figure out why it crashed without actually crashing until you know what's going on. Um, what you do with reverse debugging is you turn on reverse debugging and you say go, just continue. And then it crashes, and then you step backwards. Uh, and then you can say, okay, this is clearly wrong if we crashed, and this variable should say this. Step back, why did that variable get that? Step back, why is that there? And then eventually you find out what's wrong. It's really slow in GDB7, but it works. Uh, if you can roughly localize the area where the bug is, you can usually find it pretty easily and then just step backwards uh, until you find the bug and fix it. There's a commercial thing that's like this called undo db. I'll put a link to this in the slides when I upload it. Um, it will do the same thing, but it's much, much faster. But you have to pay for it. So, um, but it's, it's really good software if you're willing to pay for a debugger. Um, and it does the same thing, the TiVo debugging, if you will. Uh, Qt Creator I listed up here because as a visual debugger, which, again, people are going to throw fruit at me for this, it's a lot like Visual Studio. Uh, it has roughly the same default hotkeys for stepping and stepping over and stepping into and et cetera like that. It looks like it. If you don't want to use a command line interface, and I wouldn't blame you for it, this is a good place to look because it basically just wraps the command line debugger in a nice GUI so you can look at memory and step through a program and see what line of the program you're looking at right now much easier. Um, it's free software. It runs on Mac, Linux, and Windows. You can download it for free. Uh, there's something called Valgrind. Uh, I always thought that was Valgrind, and they corrected me. Uh, that runs your program under a virtual machine. You don't have to modify your program at all. I only have 10 minutes. How many more slides do I have? Okay. You don't have to modify your program at all, and it will run in a virtual machine, and it'll take note of everywhere you read and write memory and allocate memory, and as soon as you step over the end of an array or you write to memory you freed earlier, it'll be like, that's exactly where your bug is. Here's where you freed the memory. Here's where you allocated it. Go fix your problem. Uh, it's incredible. The downside is your program, they say your program will run 16 times slower. Not true. It's much worse than that. But and I think they were thinking, like, let's get, you know, something, a word processor. You hit the A key, and then you can wait a little while for the A to pop up on the screen while it checks every memory access you ever do. Uh, it's a lot harder when you can't, like, walk through the level at a reasonable pace to get to where the bug is. But uh, if you can struggle through it, it will find bugs you did not even know were in your program. They haven't heard anything yet but they will, and it's better that you found it now than your customer found it in the field. So it's an incredibly powerful tool if you can make it work for you. Now, a little faster than that is LLVM's address sanitizer. Um, it works on the same basic principle, but what it does is it instruments your code. You, Valgrind just works on any binary you run through it. Uh, address sanitizer, you have to compile the code. You add, you know, dash f sanitize equals address to the clang command line. You have to be using clang, too. That's worth noting. Um, and it'll instrument your code, and it's much, much faster. You can play your game at a usable frame rate, and it will still find a lot of those bugs for you. So um, that's also worth looking at. The downside is you have to have your program running on Clang. <clears throat> and that will, um, but that might be worth doing anyway. Clang will find a lot of bugs for you, so it's worth doing. Uh, also, don't leave this room ever. The next two talks in here cover all this debugging stuff much more, in much more detail. I'm just giving you a high-level overview here. Now, debugging OpenGL on Linux is kind of hard right now. I'm not going to lie to you. This is an area where a lot of work is being done, but things are not really super easy right now. And this is part of why we tell you to start on Windows uh, to get this running on OpenGL, because there tends to be better GL debugging tools on Windows at this moment in time. Uh, there are some options, though. There's API Trace, which is a little bit like uh, the Windows program PIX, although not nearly as good as it. But it, it will let you run back, uh, record and play back a stream and see how long each uh, rendering call took and what the state was at any given point in that. Uh, so that's worth looking at. It's open source. It's improving all the time. Uh, it works on Windows, too. You can actually use it for direct 3D debugging also. Uh, there's G-Debugger, which is AMD's thing. They used to be a, a G-Remedy or something like that. Um, they got bought by AMD. That still works on Linux. I think you need an AMD card to use it. Um, but it's there, and it's, it's, it's powerful when you can get it to work. Uh, the, the talk immediately following this one is about OpenGL debugging and open, right, uh, uh, porting stuff to OpenGL. So definitely stick around for that if you're a graphics guy. It's going to be incredibly helpful to you. Um, OK, let's talk about getting it optimized really quickly here. So you have your game. You got it running. It's debugged. But it's really, really freaking slow. Um, we talked very briefly about 
gdebugger and API trace. That'll help you on the rendering side. On the CPU side, there's a couple of different things. There's perf, there's perf which is a command line tool. I'm talking fast because he's showing the five minute thing. Um, Zoom is a commercial offering. It reminds me a lot of um, Shark or uh, Instruments, if you've ever used that on Mac OS. It's really incredible and powerful. And it'll tell you exactly where your CPU, uh, CPU time's going. API, API trace I left up here, it's for OpenGL stuff. And telemetry is incredibly good. It's from Rad Game Tools. If you're not using it, it works on every platform. And they're, debug they're actual like client side tools after you get a, a profile from your program. They actually work on Linux, so you don't have to switch over to Windows to get information, which is great. Okay. I'm gonna, this is the end of the talk, which is good. I want to leave a few minutes for questions. This is places you can get me. The slides will be up at that, Steam Dev Days, akilsadorg slash Steam Dev Days. That's my email address. That's where you can find me on Twitter. That's where you can find me on Google Plus. If you're still using Facebook, you should reevaluate some life choices you've made. Um, uh, if you hire me, you can forget this whole talk, so. Um, I, I, I'm a contractor, I'm always looking for work. So if you have something you want ported, I'll do it. Okay, I'm gonna take questions now. I'm gonna leave this slide up here. These are other talks to see. If you need my email address because you wanna give me money, I'll be around after this. But uh, there are microphones. There's a, there's a guy with a big sign with a question mark. Uh, it's not like the brick in Super Mario. Do not punch him. Um, but if you find him, he will give you the microphone. You can ask questions. These are other talks you should see today, though. And uh, I'm doing an SDL talk in great detail tomorrow, which you will find very interesting. But otherwise, just stay in this room for lots more detail on the things I talked about today. All right, first question. Uh, while you were talking about UTF-8 support, I should probably mention that C++11 has a lot of additional C++, uh, a lot of additional UTF support, including UTF-8, UTF-16 convert utilities, and UTF-8 strings in code. Uh, what he said. Uh, a lot of people aren't using C++11 yet, and some of you may never, you should be, maybe, I don't know. But it, you'll probably get there eventually. Until then, it, that was a gap for many, many years. And if you, especially have an older program, you might, not have access to that. So, but that is definitely something to consider if you're using C++11. Uh, any other questions? Just look for the guys with the question mark signs right in the middle of the uh, thing. Anyone? Oh, there's a guy. He's coming to you with a microphone. Don't get up or anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, see these talks. I'm going to move back to where you can give me money. Okay, good. There you go. Hi. <clears throat> Do you have any plans to revisit Fat Elf and try to get it merged? So, so I had a massive failure on the Linux kernel mailing list, and uh, it would be nice if they would accept those patches, because universal binaries on Linux would be awesome, but I got the impression there's a lot of hostility to the idea. Uh, for now, what we're, we've ended up doing is shipping, it, I think we're at the point where you should be shipping 64-bit binaries only, if you can get away with it. But in fact, if you download a copy of Ubuntu today, which is a Linux distribution, it's 64-bit is what they recommend by default. And I think if you look at the Steam hardware surveys, they're showing most people are moving to 64-bit, unless they have like a really crappy old netbook or something like that. But if you have to ship both, then we tend to have a little shell script that is, you know, if this is an x86 machine, run the 32-bit binary. And if it's the 64-bit machine, run the 64-bit one. And it's an awful solution, but that's where we are. So I would like Fat Elf to work, but it's probably not gonna happen. Another question. Um, I was actually just going to ask about the 32-bit uh, and 64-bit, because I've had the problems with that. If you have a 64-bit Linux, it's really hard to compile a 32-bit binary. That's what you need the Steam runtime for. Now, this is what I was saying before. Uh, the, the Steam runtime tools, uh, Sam's here somewhere. You can re talk to that guy. He's kind of one of the more responsible people for it. Um, one of the things it ships with is a copy of GCC that can target, am I right about that? That can target 32-bit or 64-bit and it will handle all those problems for you. Um, you should not, uh, I've talked about the dependencies, you should not be trying to target what's on your development machine and the Steam Runtime SDK will help you target a generic machine instead of what hap you happen to be developing on and it will solve that specific problem for you. Uh, you can also build your own cross compiler which is, uh, there's a tool called cross tool, uh, cross tool ng and that will help you do that too. That's another option uh, depending on what you need. Uh, but you can, that is a solvable problem. You can take care of that. Talk to me afterwards. We'll talk more if you want. Uh, questions, anyone? I see a hand over there. We're out of time. If you have any questions after the talk, I'll be around. Just come and shake me and you know, I'll try to update the slides if any good questions came up. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.